privileged to have 14-time All-Star, 10-time Gold Glover, two-time MVP, two-time World Series champ, and of course, the Hall of Famer, Johnny Bench, join the Just Baseball Show. We'll jump into your illustrious career in a moment, but I know that you've got something else that weighs pretty heavily on your mind right now. After your playing days, you were diagnosed with a non-melanoma skin cancer. You've since overcome this. Johnny, before we get into anything baseball, what was that journey with skin cancer like for you? Well, I think anytime anybody says cancer, it kind of gets so you get a little nervous about it and everything else. I had these blisters on the on the lower lids of my eyes, and they were blisters, and they would, you know, I could sort of pop them a little bit. I mean, and, and then, you know, but then when I was seeing my optometrist, he said, you know, you really need to get these checked out. So I went to my dermatologist. He said, I don't like the looks of those. Let's do a biopsy. Turns out both of them were basal cell carcinoma, uh, and uh, he removed them through Mohs surgery. Uh, actually, I went to even see a plastic surgeon because the eyes, you know, how the healing is on that. <clears throat> and I had no problem whatsoever. Uh, you know, that's back in 2012. So 10 years have passed. And then I, I regularly see my dermatologist, which I hope everybody does twice a year. And I had a little spot on the side of my head. And I'd actually seen a dermatologist here in Florida. Didn't think it was a problem. But uh, when I was up there just getting uh, my checkup up there because uh, I always see him when I'm in town and he said, I don't like the looks of that. He did a, a biopsy. It turned out it was a BCC. Uh, I was in the chair the next morning and, uh, that's, uh, that's the, uh, and the result was I had to have the, it had removed and it was actually at a good time because I think we worry about <clears throat> roots. I don't know how much you know about it, right? but roots had come through that. And we certainly don't want to come into a squamous cell or even to a melanoma that that really is. But most uh, basal cell carcinomas are treatable and curable. And it's just the fact that I continue to go see him every year. I, I don't know how much you, as young as you guys are, uh, that you see your dermatologist, but it's really important that that uh, uh, that we, we see them. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've got friends, you know, sometimes they come back, they look like, look like they got hit hit by a paint gun because they have all these freezing and all the stuff and everything else. But that's just another prevention thing that we want to do. We want to make sure. And, and we're our own, you know, in a, in some ways we're our own doctor. We need to check our bodies. <clears throat> we have a spouse, a mate or someone that can say, Hey, uh, this, this doesn't look right. A pimple, a freckle, a mole, something that is good. And it's just, it's so easy to go in and make an appointment, go in and see your dermatologist and have them check it out. And, and as a result with, you know, with this problem, you know, it could have gotten a lot worse. And it was a mole. It had been there for a long time. And uh, it started to get a little bit sore. I thought, okay, I'm brushing my hair uh, maybe. And I, I scraped it. But he's, as it turns out, it was just really fortunate for me that I had, was able to see him and get that taken care of almost immediately. Yeah. And you mentioned the self-monitoring practice as well. And I mean, that's less than a minute a day. That's every couple of days. If you see something weird, like check it out, right? Or have a significant other check it out. Um, real quick, is there is there somewhere that people can go to, you know, possibly learn more about this issue? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because everybody goes to the internet, but let's get real about skincancer.com. So okay. they're going to be able to give you all the answers. Uh, it's just an amazing site. There's, you know, everybody checks on the internet anyway. And, you know, you go see a doctor, you you think you're as informed as the doctor. I mean, you say, well, I was on the internet. You know, the internet's always right. In right. this case, when you start getting the information from let's get real about skincancer.com, you're going to have the answers and you're going to have questions that you can do it. You'll have a response from that. And that's the one thing. I mean, you know, you can't see your back. You can't see your, you know, there's just little spots on the back sometimes. That's good. Yeah. My uh, boy's father, grandfather, uh, he just had three basal cell. He three had three most surgeries this past week, and he was a golfer. and And so it's just not baseball players. It's, let's go. Let's go with fishing. Let's go with reflection from the sun, the side of your ears, your face, and everything else. Your back of your hands. I, I was exposing my hands while fishing, and my knees when you're wearing shorts, and it just all of a sudden that sunburn. So it's being preventative, first of all, for our youth, for our young kids back in my day. They were using, uh, you know, uh, baby oil and iodine just so they could get a great tan, which yeah. probably burning off all your derma anyway, right. and doing that. And now we're recipients of that. But 
it's not too early for even at our thirties and forties and fifties, you yeah. know, being 70, I'm, I'm still cautious. I've done it for, well, let's go back to 2012 when I really started more or less. I think sometimes we just think, you know, well, there's no, and especially if you've had any problems within your family, but I think, you know, it wasn't vogue to go see a dermatologist. It was something that was just, okay, what is he going to find? He's not going to find anything. It can't cause any problems. But we realize after a certain period of time that we really are uh, doing damage and that it will later on in your life, you're going to unfortunately see it come up with some problems. So uh, it's all important just to protect yourself. And ounce prevention, the old thing that we started when I was young, ounce yeah. prevention worth a pound of cure so you've heard it it doesn't sound like much but it is a preventative thing and and then of course the sunscreen which my kids i have 13 and 16 year old boys are very active in the sun they're in the active in the pool and everything else trying to make sure that the sunscreen and and most people say that that 30 30 uh, spf is fine and you don't have to go above that but it's important that we do this twice every two hours i should say Every two hours, it should be reapplied just because our oils and our skin and everything, and it does it. It's just a prevention thing. So uh, yeah. it's landscapers, it's hunters, it's fishermen, it's hikers. Just as simple as we're all going. And, you know, I sit here in my in my house and I see all these walkers go back and forth, and back and forth. And, and, you know, the warranties run out on all my parts. So I'm not going to be out there walking with them. But at the same time, I'm hoping that they're all being a little bit aware of the sun. And down here, you know, long sleeve shirts are in bulk. I mean, all these yeah. fish shirts and things and got it, the SPF things on them and they, and they, they've got all the UV protection and all that. Well, it's just smart to do. It's just too easy just to do it. And, you know, if just cause you wear a long sleeve shirt doesn't mean, Oh, it's too hot outside to wear it. It's just, it's just for pre prevention. Right. Totally understand that. Hey, Johnny, if you don't mind, let's jump into your baseball career. And I want to talk about it from the very top you were an Oklahoma boy, drafted by the Reds, second round at a high school in Oklahoma. When did you truly fall in love with baseball? Well, I must have been three and a half. Yeah. Yeah, my dad, uh, <clears throat> we played in the backyard. I just came back from the Field of Dreams. Well, back, it takes me back to the day when in the house that we lived in up until I was about three, it had a cornfield in the backyard. My dad would hit the ball in the cornfield. And I mean, we'd have to go search for it. And my dad was the greatest player ever. And, and we would look at it. So when I it took me back to the memories and, and my dad had wanted to be a catcher, he wanted to play in the major leagues. That was his dream. But the war came along. He, uh, he served two hitches, eight years. And so by that time, he was 25. Uh, he dropped out of school, actually, to join the army. I'm sure there's a lot of stories like that. <clears throat> but then when he came back, he was really, you know, in those days, way too old to be uh, considered played sandlot ball and uh we're watching tv and announcer came on and now setting the next superstar the switch hitting center field of oklahoma mickey mantle and i looked at my dad and i said you can be from oklahoma and play in the major leagues and, and i said that's what i want to be and he said well catching was the quickest way to the major leagues and what the major leagues need and Johnny, you were the rookie of the year in 1968, and then you went on to make 12 straight All-Star games, and you were a two-time MVP by the time you were 24 years old. Was there ever a point in your early career that you were doubted? And did anything like that let you let drive you? No, I don't think I ever did. I was just a cocky kid. I felt like, you right. know, I'd always played against older, older competition. And I say that because dad started the this team in the you know in, in a Binger, Oklahoma, town of 660 people. We rode around the back of the pickup truck and we with our little Levi's and T-shirts, and we actually knocked on doors to try to find other kids that could make up nine players so we'd have a team. And we would lose. And my dad would say, "That's all right. We'll get them tomorrow. Let's go have a cheeseburger." And then we kept practicing. I had two older brothers. They let me play against them. My outs didn't count, but I was still so. So the time I was six, then by the time I was eight, I was playing with the 10-year-olds. By the time I was 11, I was playing with 13 and 14-year-olds. And then when I was 14, 15, I started playing American Legion. So I, I think I stepped up in competition. So when I got to the minor leagues down in Tampa, Florida, uh, and uh, I didn't feel like I was overmatched. And I had, a, had been blessed with a great arm. I practiced. I you know, threw it long distances. I developed it. And then... Uh, 
so I, you know, I was saying I can throw out any man alive, which most catchers can, but I would, you know, I was saying that. And, and uh, so I had great success in the minor leagues yeah. and uh, the rookie of the year and that rookie year. I mean, I came up at the end of 67. I missed, and then I got beat out in spring training for the starting job by Don Pavletic, who had an unbelievable spring. And uh, it, I think the manager wanted to prove a point that the job wasn't mine. Here I am, a ripe old 20 years old veteran, you know. Yeah. And of course, nobody could believe a 20 year old could be catching or a 19 year old should be catching in the major leagues. So nice. Don pulled a muscle, a, cat, a hamstring in the fifth game, and he never caught another game. So I caught 54 days in a row without a day off. I caught 154 of the 158. And I was, of course, the last guy off the bus. So the warranty kind of runs out on all the parts and everything else. I'd been a real bad car wreck when I was 18, a drunk driver on the wrong side of the four lane. Wow. So I was even lucky enough. I was so fortunate just to be a bench. And I say that because the doctor said I had the biggest bones he'd ever seen in his life when I went to the emergency room. And he said, nobody else but you would walk out of this. So, you know, I suffered with, I've got five discs in my back. I've got two herniated discs. I, and so I was always, you know, uh, hurt, but at the same time, I could still go on the field and play. And so I don't think I ever really doubted it. Um, yeah. And I, I maybe it was just being a young, naive kid. And I talked about the fear of failure when I was 18. And it wasn't failing myself. It was failing all those people back in Oklahoma even a town of 600 people or the people in Oklahoma Sooners that really followed my career because they followed Mickey's, they followed Warren Spahn, they followed the great players that came out of Oklahoma. So yeah. I was, uh, I was uh, hopefully next in line to, you know, people to follow. And, and it was just a, a great run, of course. And then, and I was blessed more than anything to be played with some of the greatest players in the history of the game. So yeah. that, uh, that in itself was a driving force, but, I was, uh, I was just sort of, you know, they called me the little general because I just felt like everybody should be on on the field on time, do what they're supposed to do, play their position. And, uh, so I was really motivated by that, but the other guys were just as motivated. So we all together, we made a big red machine. And coming from a small town in Oklahoma, you had 21 kids in your graduating class in high school and you had to play some third base and even some first base before switching over to catcher then went on to be the greatest catcher of all time what prompted the switch from the hot corner or first base to the general behind the dish well I was actually a pitcher I was 84 and three lifetime pitching so I never lost a game until I was 16 years old and then in high school you know Paul James would didn't like to play third base but he would catch so then what they did was they put me behind the, they put me at third base and then put Paul as catcher. And then when I went to American Legion, I went to American Legion ball. Uh, the, uh, I'm getting all these messages. Sorry about the dings. No, but, you're good. Uh, when I, when I went to American Legion ball, which was another town 20 miles away, they had already had a, two guys that were drafted from that team guy named Daryl Griffith who played third base for the Dodgers and Matt Kuykendall who played with the Cubs and they had two brothers. So they were scouting quite a bit, but I went there to play and they already had three catchers. And here I am 15 years old. I mean, these guys are 17, 18 years old. So, you know, I was just a wet behind the ears. So I played first base and I sat on the bench a lot the first year and everything else. And uh, then I just go play at Binger and then, my final season, everybody knew I was a catcher, but I never caught. I, I even when I pitched, I pitched the regionals, the district, the county, the by district, I and the state finals and the invitational. Uh, I would take infield as a catcher so the scouts could watch me throw, and that seemed to be the one thing that that everybody was more impressed by was my, you know, what I practice and the transfer and the throwing and the and the stuff. So, and that's how basically the the Reds who really never scouted me um, found me. And it was just by a fluke that they ever even knew that I existed. But the Cubs, I, I was more likely to be a Cub than I was for certainly any other, any, for any other team. The Cubs and the Orioles were very interested. Uh, I don't think Cubs and Orioles fans are very uh, happy hearing that from you right now, but. Um, well, I mean, I had Randy Hundley at the Cubs, you know, it might've been a whole different scenario for my career. You yeah. know, a lot of times they'll take a young catcher, and they'll keep him down so they can season him. They yes. don't understand if you can catch, you can catch now. 
but they all know it needs to be a better ball, call a better ball game. And, you know, there's all these guys that have an idea that they can call better. They can always call a pitch better. And it's not about that. It's the when the pitch is supposed to be called, what batter you don't want to pitch to. And so there's an understanding that goes with that. But we've got so many guys back even those days before analytics that yeah. <clears throat> basically, you know, they were much smarter than the guy on the field. And that was what really, that was the thing that made Sparky Anderson was so great was yeah. the first day in spring training, he asked me my opinion. And it was like, what? Yeah. Thinks I have a brain, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I was elevated to another level. I was actually on a level where, you know, management management's here, players are here. And all of a sudden, Sparky put me up there. And he didn't use, you know, we talked all the time. The four of us would talk, Pete, Joe, Tony, and myself. We'd be in a meeting or he'd call me in. And what would you think of this guy? No. What do you think of this guy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we worked hand in hand. And Sparky never gave me a sign. Uh, the whole time. I knew I'll need any other manager. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, I know you have to run soon. So I think we each have one more for you. My last okay. one. Um, are there certain guys in today's game that you gravitate towards watching? I know at the catching position over the last you know, couple of months, baseball has fallen in love with what Adley Rutschman is doing right now. Um, but, you know, there might be a, sorry, my phone's ringing right now too. Um, I know the baseball world has just kind of fallen in love with Adley Rutschman right now, but I know that you've spoken very highly of what Yadier Molina has been able to do behind the plate. Is there a certain catcher that you just love to watch catch in today's game? Well, you know, Adley won my award, the college catcher of the year award. So there's all of these guys, we've got about 12 of them in the major leagues. We've had over the period of time of 20 years, the three finalists. Now we've gone to Cincinnati where we have the award and we've, the last three or four years, we've actually just uh, chosen one player. And Adley, uh, I texted him the other day and told him how proud I was of him. And, uh, you know, you go to Salvador Perez. Uh, then, then you know, Will Smith, let's just say. I mean, here, here's the kind of guy that's just so durable and every day out there. And he doesn't get the credibility that I think he can deserve because, you know, he's adequate by with the arm. He's adequate with this and everything else. And I say adequate means that he's really at a high level. And, and if you, if you understand the fact that there's only 15, 16 catchers in the hall of fame, you're only getting one for every decade. Yeah. So they say, where are all the catchers? They're still there. But until you drive in a hundred runs and lead the league in home runs or RBIs or become the MVP, you really don't get the notice and the appreciation. We've got catchers now that are hitting 170 or in the lineup. Yeah. And, and management back in our day would never settle for that. But analytics say because he's playing and you know, whatever that wins above replacement or war, or whatever yeah. those things are. And, and you know, and the you've got a good one, by the way, you've got a good war. Yeah, so it's pretty good. I, I understand. I've heard <laughs> it. it's, uh, but you find that, you know, these guys in the lineup, even though they are basic outs, they are rally killers, you know, they're still, you know, still in the lineup. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, Grandel, you know, he was, He's hit, and it's impossible for him to hit 180 or 190 or whatever it is because he's a switch hitter with all kinds. Some people just get consumed by bodies. Some people become upper body hitters. Some people lower body hitters. I was talking to a hitter with the Reds the other day, and I said, your body's drifting. Everything, why are you going this way? I said, you got the best hands in the game right now. And so I said, and so he listened a little bit. Now he's, he's the last you know, 10 or 12 games, he's getting, he's hitting about 300. And, you know, and what I try to tell young, young hitters is that, you know, they're hitting 220 or 200 or 230. I said, just try to, for your next hundred at bats, get 27 hits. Don't worry about this. They're not worried about it. You're in the lineup. They think they have faith in you. Uh, but there's so many great catchers out there today, but if you, till you get the accolades, you really aren't going to be considered that. But to look around now to see uh, see what's going on, and uh, it's they're they're tremendous athletes, and they're they're stretching out on the ground. They're doing all the splits. They're doing this yeah. stuff. I have never touched my toes in my life, much <laughs> less like. And uh, last one for me. I mean, we're speaking with the great Johnny Bench, and some refer to Yogi Berra, Carlton Fisk, Josh Gibson, Mike Piazza, Roy Campanella, and yourself as the greatest catchers of all time. I have to know who are your top five catchers of all time. Wow. Well, I mean, you, you got to go with Yogi and you got to go with Campanella and you got to go with uh, 
you know, um, you know, strangely enough, Bill Dickey got 13 consecutive years at 100 games or more, which we tied for that, which was really kind of a in itself an endurance chance. Uh, Yadier's done it. And I love Carlton Fisk. I just thought he was just I thought, you know, the years that he had, you know, we talk about great catchers with Bob Boone. But Bob didn't put up any numbers. So, I mean, is you never, now you got the offensive side of what you're trying to achieve and everything else. Pudge Rodriguez was, I mean, I, you couldn't have done it much better than he did it as well. I mean, he was durable. He stayed on there. He defense offense. And so, but to have the combination of both of those together is an unbelievable thing. Last year, Salvador hit like 40 million home runs, 47, 48 home runs. And so, we look at that, but I mean, to watch him catch and to see that arm and to see his, you know, the way it was and everything else to watch a catcher call a game. I can't really equate that because you're not watching every pitch. You're not watching, you know, the situations in which a hitter comes up and, you know, a pitcher, and our, we had one of our pitchers or a couple of our pitchers, they would walk four or five and the reporter would come up and say, well, he didn't have much control tonight. He walked five. I said, I walked four. Mm meaning that I couldn't get this guy in a situation out that would might hurt our, uh, hurt our, their offense. So mm -hmm. I would pitch, I would walk him to pitch the guy on deck because I knew if my pitcher could get him out. So it was just a matter of developing a relationship with a pitcher that right. say, Hey, oh, you have to understand what I'm calling back here is to get the hitter out and let him get himself out because you're out pitch maybe only one time. And so I need you to make these pitches let him chase, let him go after something that gets him out. And if not, we'll get the guy on deck. And if, if necessary, we'll walk him too, because the guy in the dugout, certainly we can get out because I've got the stuff to do that with you. And so once you have that confidence and develop that repertoire with uh, and rapport with the pitcher, now you can start to manage a game. And so it's my canvas and I want to paint it. And if mm -hmm. I've got the arm out there, you know, scouts would say, well, he can't hit the curveball. And I would say, who's curveball? Because, you know, Jim McLaughlin didn't have, you know, Burt Blylevin's curveball. Right. So, and there's just things that you have to equate into this. So, uh, I, I still you know, I love to watch the game. I still watch <coughs> our young players, our young catchers that are out them and pull for them. And I mean, Suzuki's still playing, you know, and he was yeah. one of the very first of all, all times. But I remember there was a guy named Dave Ricketts that caught, for the Cardinals. And, you know, you looked at him and he was like 220, 230. Back now, he'd be a star. But now, at two, how did he stay in the lineup? Because if you get a great receiver, a great catcher that can fill in at times, Bill Plummer was a great one for us. My roommate was Pat Corrales. We had guys, Vic Carell and, and, and Alex uh, Trevino. We had guys that were ready to play when I wasn't in the lineup. And they filled in and they did a job. So if you can catch, they pretty much, you're pretty much assured you'll have a job for a long time. How about that. Johnny Bench, this was awesome. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. the time. All right. Let's go to the website again, guys. Let's get yes. real about sons, let's, let's get real about sonscancer.com. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Johnny. Jack, Peter, thank you. Thanks so much, Johnny. All right.